thank you for joining this webinar and Poison Our Wine. Uh, my name is Regine Rattioni and I'm a member of the Unpoison Group, which is a newly formed civil society group working towards agrochemical policy reform and campaigning for a transition away from the very high usage of toxic chemicals in South Africa. Um, Unpoison is made up of uh, many organizations and concerned citizens spanning advocacy and research, farmers, farm workers, doctors, professors, lawyers, activists, journalists, scientists, and many more. So today's topic, Unpoison Our Wine, is our first crop-focused webinar with the intention of showcasing the alternatives uh, to chemical farming and offering guidance for farmers who might consider transitioning if the process is demystified. Um, I think as, as many of us are aware, the resistance um, that comes up from the farming community is, but they, what is the alternative? Show us the alternatives. Um, alternative solutions have been uh, suppressed um, intentionally or not intentionally. And so it's very difficult for farmers to know the way to go. Um, uh, the Western Cape uh, is home to the most biodiverse floral kingdom in the world, the wine sector makes up a significant portion of our regional economy and employs over 300,000 people. I'm not sure if that stat has changed since COVID. To my knowledge, the Western Cape has the highest concentration of agrochemical use um, here in the soft, for the soft fruit industry. And while the wine sector is much better than others due to the standards we adhere to for export, we are still using highly hazardous pesticides banned in the EU um, legally on our vineyards. And um, we set to lose significant portions of our agricultural land to climate change. We're experiencing the sixth mass extinction. Um, lifestyle diseases and chronic illness have become an epidemic um, in our country and around the world, but lifestyle diseases are the biggest killers in South Africa. Um, and in the farming regions, respiratory and chronic ailments um, are very, very common. So as members of Unpoison, we have a dream for the South African wine sector, that it can transition to become the most ecological and fair farming region in the world, that it in, that it embraces transitioning to find a niche that can be a unique selling point in the wine uh, sector globally um, and embrace best practices in the world for all of us, people, planet and profit. So that's all from me. Thank you for listening. Um, we have a really wonderful speaker lineup um, of three farmers, and then three professionals involved in auditing, certifying, um, and, uh, and championing uh, uh, better wine practices. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Johan Reinecke of Reinecke Wines. Um, and Johan is going to share his story, his reasons, and, um, and unpack the process. So let me just unmute. Uh, Johan, can you unmute yourself? There we go. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Super. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Um, hi to my friends and colleagues in the industry, and thanks for having me, Regine. Um, when we had a brief sort of a, a chat yesterday, we spoke about, you know, what, what was I going to try and convert in my 15 minutes. And I thought that there were three things I wanted to share with people. The first one is to try and understand why farmers use poison. Um, the second one would be what, what the alternatives are. And then the third one would be um, what the role of the consumer is in this whole process. So to give you a quick bit of background, um, I don't have any formal education in, in farming or viticulture or oenology. I started off, um, I did a degree in environmental ethics in philosophy. And my work in the wine industry started as a farm laborer. 
and I just fell in love with farming and all things vines and wine, and it's become my life um, over what the course of the last 25, 27 years. Um, but I can remember I felt uneasy to use the herbicides and pesticides and fungicides for, for two reasons. The one was what I was reading in the evenings was very similar to your opening comments, Regine. And this is this idea that, you know, we're now firmly embedded in the Anthropocene age where our progress has reached such a point that it has the potential to undermine our very existence. And this is the first time in human history that this has happened. So it is a, a serious time for introspection and to, to tread cautiously. And, uh, you know, I, I think all the books that I read in the evenings, Arne Ness and Aldo Leopold and all the en environmental gurus, with that knowledge comes obligation to act in accordance. So from an intellectual point of view, I found it increasingly difficult to continue farming in the conventional way. And then being a farm laborer was also different because if I used to work on a number of different farms and two farmers are the same, but um, I remember instances where I was handed uh, chemicals and things to use. And even if I did have protective clothing, um, it didn't sit well with me because on the can that you get to use, there's a skull and crossbones and it was cancer and you must wash your hands before you eat and everything else. So I think from an intellectual and from a physical level, I just became increasingly uncomfortable with this. And I then reached a point where I just decided to stop. But we're not a multi-generational farming family. My dad was teaching at the university and my mom was a nurse at the hospice in Stellenbosch. And the whole farming operation was funded by the bank. So before I just switched over and stopped using herbicides and pesticides and fungicides on my farm, I had to get in the buy-in of our bank manager. And this gentleman said to me, you know, I must be careful. Um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of success around organic farming. We're talking back in the late 1990s now in viticulture in, in, in Stellenbosch. There were a few people who tried, but it didn't really work out so well. So if you want to do it, just do it on a small scale first and see that you can get it right before you just, you know, jump in hook, line and sinker with, with all the vineyards under your stewardship. And I then took a, a small portion of farm, um, literally a quarter of a hectare of pinotage at the time. And I just stopped using herbicides and pesticides and fungicides. And it's important to know that I actually failed dismally. I had every weed, pest, plague you can find in the Western Cape in my vineyard within six months. And it, it was so embarrassing that at harvest time when I had to take the grapes to my local cooperative, my driver at the time, I refused to drive with the grapes and I had to get on the tractor and take them myself. And it, it was a very difficult time from an existential point of view because I was under the impression that I was kind of loving and she wasn't loving me back. And I, I couldn't understand it because I was also brought up and told, you know, you must do the right thing and do what you believe in, which is really what I, I tried to do. So fortunately, um, I was told of a, a wonderful lady who lived in Wellington. Her name was John Malherbe, and she was a sort of a doyen of organic and in particular biodynamic farming back in the day. And she came to the farm and she explained to me and she said to me, my dear, you are being organic by neglect. You must become so by design. And then she explained to me that farmers didn't use chemicals and poisons because they enjoyed doing it. They did it because they had to do so to protect their, their crops. And what needed to be done was not just to simply stop using the chemicals, but rather to have a re-education of sorts taking place and an alternative sustainable system that one could then employ to address the challenges that farmers had up to that point been addressing chemically. So for given the time allocated for this discussion, I can't go into too much detail, but I'll give you 
two or three examples what we did. So the first thing that John taught me, which was fascinating, was that I was actually farming with two things. In the short term, I was farming with, with, with my grapes, with my vines. But in the long run, I was actually farming with soil. And if you took a very short term view, these two were often at odds. So if you try to grow flowers or veggies at your house, the first thing you would do would be to remove all the weeds because they compete for food and moisture with your plants. But conversely, if you go for a walk in the mountain or in Yonkosuk or up Table Mountain, the only bare soil you'll ever see will be roads and things that were cleared by people. So for soil to live, it really needs to be covered and preferably so by living plants, at least by mulch. And, you know, what? this kind of created a, a sort of a paradox. Do I clean and remove the weeds for the sake of my vines or do I leave them there for the sake of my soil? And it becomes more complex if you, if you consider what the concept of sustainability actually means. You know, and in this point in time, if you talk sustainable, everybody thinks green. But in my humble opinion, sustainability is a three-legged chair. It is about looking after nature, and it's about looking after people, but it's also about looking after money. And we live in a time where we can exploit nature the longest and get away with it. And I would say people the second longest and get away with it. But the moment you run out of money, you run out of business. So one must be cognizant of that fact and keep that in, in one's mind when you endeavor to become truly sustainable farmer. It's a, it's a balancing act. What helped me a lot was when Jean gave me the long-term view. And it was Jean, and it was also a, a Dr. Uwe Hoffmann who came from Geisenheim University in Germany. And they explained to me that there is a correlation between soil health and plant health. And that as one builds the humus levels in your soil, the natural resilience or resistance of the plants that live there increase significantly. So to put some numbers to it, I farm here in the Polka Dry Hills outside Stellenbosch. Our soils are incredibly old and extensively weathered. And if you go into a conventional vineyard here and you measure the humus levels, it's going to be around 0.5 to 0.7%. If you walked into a conventional vineyard in, in France or in Europe or in America, you'd probably be around about 2%. But the ideal would be to try and build one soil up to about 5%, because when you got to 5%, the plants that lived there, their resilience in, would increase by as much as 300%. So in the initial phase, what seems like a sort of a paradox or a trade-off actually pays off if you take a longer-term view. And to this day, 20 odd years later, we've now built our humus levels at about 4.3. But we've tried to balance these two acts. And, and, and when I say these two acts, I mean, we've tried to look after the financial sustainability of our business. So there were years where, where the vines were struggling and the yields were low, where we sort of erred on the side of caution and were a bit more vigorous in our weed management and looking after our wines better. And then we had other seasons where we had excess growth and a lot of rain where we could really focus on building our soils. Um, I then want to just go a quick step further and say that instead of just removing plants mechanically, we understood that it was a good idea to try and outgrow them with beneficial ones. But this is also quite complex. It's not a simple thing to do. So three to five years into um, organic and biodynamic farming, what I had intended to do was to build my soil humus levels for the reasons that I've just explained. And the best way to build them was to plant a lot, uh, uh, cover crops that gave a lot of organic matter, like your, your, your oats or your, or your uh, rye or triticale grass species, and then flatten them with a tractor tire and then inoculate with, with the microbial solution. And I experimented with PrEP 500, biodynamics, um, EM. I even bought some microbes from a, a, a multinational company. And I could see the earthworms come back and I could see how the soil became loose and dark and textured and rich. But all of a sudden, my yields just plummeted and, and, and sustainable, financially sustainable yields for me is about five to six times per hectare and they dropped right down to three. And what had happened was if you, if you build a perfect compost heap, you try and take one pot nitrogen like cow manure for, and combine it with 30 pots carbon like, 
I don't know, straw or bits and stems and skins from the cellar or whatever. But my soil was also trying to build itself. And with all the cover crops that I had sowed, um, that ratio got skewed one to 500. And in its endeavor to build itself, it was sucking up all available nitrogen. And as a consequence, my yields dropped. So then I had to remedy that by planting different plants in the vineyard, focus more on legumes and things. And I also had to introduce animal husbandry. So today I have a herd of about 15 guni cows. They live in the vineyards in the winter months. I try and circulate them through the vineyards about five times. And then we also um, collect the waste and build compost and, and, and put that in. So it, it's a sort of a balancing act. And these are the alternatives, but they are complex and they do take time to put systems in place. I mean, they're wonderful. Um, our production costs dropped significantly because we became less reliant on external inputs to get our farm going. We don't have to buy fertilizer, albeit organic or of any kind anymore because of the amount of compost that we can make on our farm. Um, but it takes time to align multiple organic systems in such a way that they feed off each other in a synergistic way and make your farm truly sustainable. And it's it's effort and it's education and it's understanding. You know, there's a, a difference between knowledge and understanding. Knowledge you can get from listening to this or reading a book or, or, or getting a, I don't know, some, something off YouTube or the internet, but understanding comes through experience and, and actually doing it for a period of time. So I think the alternatives are there. Um, I'll quickly, I see I've got about three minutes left. Um, just the other examples, obvious ones, you know, you have, uh, we, we've got a problem with the acidity of our soil. So we had to bring in lime. With the lime came a lot of snail eggs. Um, the conventional remedy would be to put snail bait down, but you then not only kill the snails, and, but you also harm all the wild, wild birds that eat the snail bait and your dog that lick the pellets because they're coated with a nice substance. And that a much easier or, or more, not easier, but a more logical uh, uh, remedy for me would be to invest in ducks. So I took my truck and I bought 100 or 200 ducks, put them on the farm, they ate the snails, gave a lot of manure. And then some of the things were a bit more complex. We have leaf roll virus. This virus is spread through the saliva of a little insect called a mealybug. Back in the day when I was a laborer on conventional farms, we had to wear special suits and helmets and use really heavy chemicals to combat these, these bugs to try and prevent them from spreading the, the leaf roll virus through the vineyards. And today I know that these insects prefer to live on the roots of dandelions. So I allow dandelions to grow in my vineyard and uh, these mealybugs are much safer from predation if they live on the dandelion roots than if they live in the vines. So it's a complex process, but it's, it's, it's totally doable. But I think people must understand that farmers aren't a malicious bunch of individuals that like to go around and spray poison. I think financially they're struggling. They've got their backs against the wall. They have all the business risks that any other business person would have. In addition to that, they have all the natural risks. And they're not really at the top of the food chain if you look at the capitalist game pyramid. So to go to such a person and I'll tell them they must employ a new methodology, which in task and something unfamiliar, easy sell to a farmer. Um, and that's where I just want to finish off by emphasizing the importance and the role of the consumer. A, a farmer is these days afford to be production driven anymore. The, the competition is too tough. You have to be uh, aware of market forces. There's no sense for farmers to produce food if they can't sell it, or if uh, the, 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 the market is so overcompeted that they're not making money anyway. Um, and there the consumer plays a huge role. And over the years, if I look, you know, we, we started late 90s, around about 2000, up until 2006, 2008, I could do my best to try and convince a lot of other farmers to, to go the shoot, uh, winemakers, and they would come to the farm and they would be genuinely interested. But 
it wasn't enough, the, the ethics of the situation, to just get them over the threshold to commit and to take the risk. They, they felt too vulnerable. But after 2006, there was a definitive swing. It started in Scandinavia, and then it sort of moved through Northern Europe and trickled across the rest of the world, where the consumer demanded more ethically produced, sustainably produced food and drink. And as soon as that happened, the people started beating a path to our door. How do you do this? What is, how, how, tell me, how do I farm like this? How do I make wine like this? So I think, you know, people must vote with their money and people must not underestimate their power as a consumer to drive change in this agricultural sector. And it is such an important sector. It's one of the biggest contributors to global warming. And as a consequence, it's also one of the best levers we have to try and fix things and remedy things to a certain degree. I think that's, that's been more than my 15 minutes, but thank you. Thank you so much, Johan. Uh, I think you answered a lot of questions um, that many people have, but there are more questions. Um, okay, so I think one of the first questions that we had is that, did you quantify the RAND value drop of input costs? So have you actually measured um, your cost savings and what it costs you now in comparison? Uh, yes, Sasha, so it's actually, uh, it was amazing. It, it, it really surprised me. So what happened was, I would say about three or four years ago, the production average for viticulture in Stellenbosch was around 50,000 rands per hectare. Uh, today, it's probably closer to 60. But at the time, it was around 50,000 rands per hectare. And my auditors came to me and they said to me, um, uh, you know, it's, it's good to see that your business is, is improving and it seems that your farming uh, seems to become more profitable. And at the time, I could kind of, you know, see it. I wasn't in this chronic cash flow uh, pinch that I've become so accustomed to over the years. Um, but it was still strange because, as a conventional farmer, my yields were closer to seven, eight tons per hectare, and I was now farming and producing around five or six tons per hectare. So we sat down and we had a good analysis to just try and understand why my business became more profitable. And the, the single reason was the decrease in my production costs. And they had dropped right down at that time and they were around 37,500 rands per hectare. Hmm. So if the average in my area was 50, I managed to farm for around 37. Hmm. And I think the reasons for that is obvious. Uh, most of my colleagues in the wine industry rely on big farmer or big agra to, to farm. And, and those are monopolies. Uh, it's kind of, I mean, everybody knows it. It's Bayer, Monsanto, Syngenta, these guys. And, you know, South African rands, with all due respect to them, is like monopoly money. They're not interested in our currency because it's, it's weak and it's so risky to be paid in dollars and, and GB pounds and euros and stuff, Swiss franc. So the price of Roundup, for example, would jump um, by much more than our inflationary figures. And if you were not reliant on that product to continue farming, um, you know, you were kind of spared that expense. But I think probably the biggest benefit that we have, and, and, and that is, I often say to people the difference between an organic and a biodynamic farm. You know, so as soon as you talk biodynamics, people have this concept of this voodoo of viticulture and the cow horns and the preps and the stirring of the vortex and everything else. But the biggest benefit to me of, of going the biodynamic route is it shifted my farm from being sustainable to being self-sufficient. So if I, if I may, mm. uh, maybe I'm talking too much. Um, I, I just got so much to share with you guys, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. That keep was going. the question. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think we're, okay, all, keep going. we're just all on two the minutes. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so if, if you think of waste, waste is a, it's a cultural concept. It doesn't exist in nature. If you think of 
anything on this planet, in the air, on the soil, in the water, in the soil. There's only one thing that wastes, and that's us. We have breakfast, we have lunch, we have dinner, we eat stuff, we throw stuff away all of the time. And what I, what I find is nature doesn't waste. A, a tree drops a leaf and that leaf gives life to something else. So if, while I was farming conventionally or organically, I would still have waste at my cellar with all the pips and the stems and the skins. And the same would, we would go for the animal husbandry. Um, I would have a build up manure of manure at the kraal. But the idea of the biodynamic farm is to create a self-sufficient hull where you become as little dependent as possible from external inputs. So we could literally, instead of paying for someone to remove the waste from the cellar or dropping it on the other side of the hill where no one could see it, but it would still acidify and damage the soil, we found a way to kind of feed that to our cows. And, instead of leaving the manure to build up and get incredibly high nitrogen levels, which would also not be good for the soil, we can now take that and feed that back into the vineyard. So you end up with almost a circular economy of sorts on your farm. And Sasha, I think that was together with the lower production costs, that, 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 that self-sufficiency really saved our farm. Thanks, Johan. Okay, so I've got two, two more questions for you, if you can give very short answers to those that I can move on to Johan Dalport from right. Waverley. The first question I have for you, you can hear I'm not a farmer, um, is, is there any profit from your cover crops or are those purely part of closing the loop? Uh, the, the answer would be the second one. So, but they play multiple roles. Okay. People must understand. They, they build soil, they outcompete weeds, they feed my vines, and they feed my cows. So I'm looking for multiple benefits of whatever I do. And even if I have something like quirk or couch grass, which is allelopathic in my vineyard, I remove it manually, um, but then I feed that back to the cows again. So, so it just, yeah, I'm just Thank you. And double thinking. How much time did it take you, Johan, to not to get to where you are now with 4.3% humus, but how much time did it take you to cross the line and actually start becoming, um, uh, standing on all three legs? I think it's a lifetime journey, to be honest. Uh, if you start, it's like, I think, stopping smoking. You know, I can see the benefits almost immediately, but they continue over 15 or 20 years. So... Within a few months, you, you'll see your soil come back to life and you'll, you'll see the life come back to the farm. And after three years, you'll get your certification. But after five to seven years, you can actually really start tasting radical stuff in the wines that you couldn't taste before and things like that. So, yeah, it's not a specific point in time, but it, you can see it from the beginning and it just continues to get better. Try it. I can, I'm, Great. I'm a believer. Thank you so much, Johan. I'm going to move on to Johan Dalport now from Waverley Wines, um, but we'll keep more questions for the end. And a question that Georgina asked, which is a very good question, especially talking about how we transition, is the difference between organic and biodynamic. But I'm going to um, just trust that some of our speakers are going to be getting there and it will be answered during the talk. Um, otherwise, we'll answer it at the end, Georgina. So, Johan Dalport from Waverley Wines is the production manager of Waverley Hills, um, which is the most awarded vineyard in the country. Um, Johan Dalport, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself, and then it's over to you. Um, yes, good morning. Can you hear me? I think I'm unmuted now. Loud and clear. Um, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and everybody that's um, tuned in, welcome. And uh, yeah, just a short um, a few words from me regarding Waverly Hills. And yeah, I, I'll get to the, um, the thing for, for me, the, the important uh, uh, matter I would like to uh, bring over through this, through this talk. Yeah, and the journey of Waverly Hills, say, started about, say, 21, 22 years ago uh, when, when the farm was uh, developed as an organic wine farm. 
at that, that stage, we were still part of a company called Breno Chem. Breno Chem is, all, is a recycling company that works in the wine industry. So they, they were taking all the byproducts from the wine industry and then reproduced into, into other products. Um, yeah, so, so when they developed the wine farm, it was just natural for them to, to do it organically as they, the, the whole philosophy behind the company um, was um, recycling and, and um, a natural way of, of doing things. Yeah, so the um, Brino Chem has been going for more than 50 years now already. So they've been in the recycling um, business for, for five decades, more than five decades. Um, okay, since that time, uh, Wavell is not part of Brino Chem anymore, but um, still, still the same original owners that, that owns the, the, the Wavell Hills, the wine farm. Um, at, at Waverly Hills, yes, our, um, the passion of making organic wine is more than just making organic wine, it's making good wine. Um, I think that that's the first step one must sort of um, focus on. And also, I think that also um, ties into what Johan Reineke said is uh, you have to. Yeah, the wine you have to make needs to be good. Otherwise, people are not going to buy it if it's organic or not organic. But if the wine doesn't taste good, they will only buy it once. And they will not buy it again. It doesn't matter if it's organic or not, they won't buy your wine again if it doesn't taste well. So that's, that's the whole uh, passion of, of wife leaves, making good wine, but in a of organic philosophy and organic matter of, of how we do it. And, and I think that, that is also where the challenge lies for, for the people in the, say, the natural community or the organic community to encourage other people to, 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 to drink better organic wine, drink good organic wine. Because unfortunately, there is that, that sort of perception that organic wine doesn't taste well. And I think that is where I would like to I like to um, uh, make it, make the point in the, with, with this presentation is uh, there is unfortunately perception people from people that organic wine doesn't taste well and that maybe with, with good reason as well maybe in the past there were exa examples of organic wine that was not that good and um, yeah there is unfortunately also uh, without um, naming anyone or any particular um, institution or entity. Um, there is a, a certain supermarket that's sort of with the reputation of, of selling healthier products. Um, some of our wines, and I think some of Reineke wines is also available in, in that supermarket, but they also have cheaper examples of organic wine that they sell that the quality is not always that good. And of course, if people want to try something, they go to the supermarket, or try something organic, they go to the supermarket. But like with any other consumer, if you don't know something, you will rather not spend that much on something you don't know and try something cheaper, just to try it and see how it is. Then people buy the, 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 um, the lesser good quality organic one and then after they taste it, they think it all organic wine tastes like that. Then there's their perception of what organic wine tastes like, and, and the side is not for them, and they won't and they won't try it again. Johan, can can I ask you a question? Yes, yes, of can course. Can you share a little bit with how what it is that you do to make good tasting organic wine? So for for organic wine farmers, are there any? Obviously, those are your secrets mm -hmm. as the winemaker. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's no secret. I think it's just a matter of hard work. Um, and um, like with any other wine, even conventional wine, to make good conventional wine or make good organic wine, uh, obviously starts in the vineyard. You have to have a good raw product. You have to have good grapes. So your farming practices need to be all well and, and well managed. So there's no, there's no real secret. I think it's just a matter of trying to do everything right. And everybody in the team, everybody on the farm must buy into that, into that, that quality 
um, mindset. So, yeah, I, I can't really so, yeah, to, to, to tell you this is we're doing that better year, we're doing this. Um, every farm is different also, and I think every, every farmer, wine farmer will tell you that every farm is unique. So to, to tell me, to tell you what I do here uh, is going to work, but it's probably not going to work on another farm. So you, you have to, by trial and error, basically, you, you find out, you, you start to know your vineyards, you start to know the grapes, you start to know the, the different um, blocks of vineyard and parts in the blocks and where, what cultivars work and what, what time it needs to be picked and how, it, and how to use how the processing in the, in the cellar. So there's no, I wouldn't say there's a silver bullet or there's a, or it's a certain recipe. It's just a matter of trying to do everything right and get that that, that works for you. Yeah, so for me to continue, yeah, as I said, um, regarding the um, making good organic wine, for me, it's um, getting people to know it, to know that organic wine, not only Waverly Hills, for me, it's not only it's not about one single brand, some organic brands about the, the whole um, organic wine sector for me needs to, to grow because there's, there's not enough people that, that only drink organic wine. Um, I would say, if you're looking at statistics, about 95 or even more percent of wine drinkers will drink organic wine also, but not only, say, maximum 5% of wine drinkers will only drink organic wine. And you, you can't make wine for only 5% of the consumer. And that's why Reineke said, you still need to be a business, you still need to make money. Um, so that's why we, we are basically, so the organic sector is competing with all other wines, not only with okay, other organic wines, it's competing with all the other wines on the shelf, um, conventional wines as well. And um, said for, then for people, to, to change over to drinking organic wine because it's the right way to do it. As we know, um, just out of uh, environmental sense, it's the right way to farm. They must be um, comfortable with, with the quality of the wine. And there is more than enough really good quality organic wines available. So this is where we need to bring over that message um, the only way is basically the proof is in the pudding. Um, produce good organic wines through the experience that you have um, get caught on your farm, but that works for you, that works in your cellar. So we can grow the organic wine sector as a whole, not, not only the brands, but because there's really good quality organic wines available. Thank you, Johan. Um, I think this forum particularly uh, is driven um, to deliver consumer awareness um, and yes. to really to really help um, educate farmers and the public and consumers and journalists, um, you know, about about organic wines and and just choosing to to eat um, non toxic. Uh, yeah, non toxic mm. foods. Um, Johan, I would just also like to know how long did it take the, the farm to transition? Yeah, so the, the farm started out organic. So, the first, when, when the first vineyards were, were planted back in, I was it 1999, 2000, thereabout, it was, it was um, planted um, as, as organic. So, we, we only went through the, the, that first phase of a three year conversion period. So the, the, a matter the farm was conventional and we, we changed it over to organic. It was organic from the start. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Waverly Hills is a, is a beautiful shining example to, to any new farmers that are wanting to, to farm um, organically. So, yeah, thank you for doing what you do, Johan. Um, and we'll do our best to uh, get the message to more consumers. Uh, Brett Sander from Cold Mountain. I know Brett is on the road. Um, so, Brett, are you ready to join us? What would be really great to hear is um, your perspective as a farmer, um, the challenges, other messages to other farmers. Um, so, over to you. Hi, good morning, all. 
Uh, sorry about that. Yes, was pulled over to a delivery. So apologies for my no picture. So yes, we took over as a family, Cold Mountain uh, from Brunier Wines in 2016. Um, that being our first season. The farm previously had been run for 10 years, uh, started and vineyard started 10 years prior from about 2007 uh, to about 2009 uh, that the majority of the vineyards were planted. We have 17 hectares of vineyards, 11 hectares Sauvignon Blanc and then a hectare odd of Pinot, Chardonnay, Syrah and Simeon. And I'm coming from a background of, I studied economic development and investment management, but had a strong focus on economic development. And with that background, uh, used organic farming and artisan uh, development systems and value chains to look to, de to develop cooperative economies. And we began a vegetable farming operation and uh, leaf farming, uh, salad leaves, rocket, etc., in Johannesburg. And my brother at the time was a studying uh, winemaking and in Elsenburg. And while I was doing our more practical agrarian and development work, uh, he was studying and doing the winemaking side of the of his skills development here in Western Cape and in 2016 he I moved down from Johannesburg and the family looked at buying a, a the piece of land on in Stanford and last year Wade joined us on the farm so immediately as we took over the farm um, started a conversion process uh, the farm, as I said before, was completely conventional. So roundups and paraquats and fungicides and growth stimulants, chemical fertilizers were all used. And we began a gradual weaning process on majority of the vineyards and quite a drastic change on the four smaller blocks. The first two years, um, we was for, for us, the first port of call was to get rid of uh, Roundup and weed killers on the farm. And that became a mechanical process, uh, which we did scoffling with our staff for the first two years and very quickly realized the cost implications and where the balancing act begins, where the loss of income potentially from how we are farming, the reduction of uh, yields, uh, the increase of labor cost all started to balance out um, in terms of the input costs. So for us, the first two years, I think while there was still quite a lot of reserves of chemical inputs in the ground and there was relatively balanced uh, chemical compositions around, this, around the farm due to chemical fertilizers and the buildup of those over the years, we had very solid yields, um, over 10, 11 tons on a lot of the vineyards. And that slowly started dropping off. By 2019, 2018, we were where we wanted to be and where we thought what was sustainable, five, six tons a hectare. Um, but at that point, the four hectares were completely off all uh, chemical inputs. And we had gone into copper sulfur regimes using things like trichodermis to manage fungi planting cover crops, etc. But even with the cover crops, as um, uh, uh, Johanna has alluded to, we saw that, especially in the soils that we are, we have quite varied soils all over the farm, that the nitrogen impact was quite uh, significant with, with a lot of the cover crops. And we actually halted cover crops for two years and started adding just a lot more compost. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it has been bought in from our side. We just did not have the animals and the labor for the biomass creation with compost. A lot of our labor was, we have 17 hectares of vineyards. We run figs, we do vegetables, we do flower picking. So the 
balancing of labor in the organic system has been something that we have been going through over those over the last five years and have slowly started to move more and more labor towards biomass uh, collection, control, chipping, composting, etc. But a lot of it for us is still bought in compost from guys like Reliance, etc. And that we are trying to wean ourselves off as well. Um, the more recent issue for us in terms of management has been fungal management. And for us, it is, yes, our soils have been seen improvement in our soil quality and our organic matter um, recording. But I think two reasons for us, the imp or the buying in of compost, I think for us has not had, has allowed for fungal inputs onto the farm that otherwise wouldn't be in here. And for us, this is some of the reason why we are trying to produce much more and build up our animal husbandry on the farm so that we can produce enough compost for our own uses. And then also looking for the right mix of cover crops, depending on the blocks. We have blocks that are very coarse. We have blocks that are loamy. We have blocks that are clay. We have blocks that are sit on uh, uh, more sandstone type varieties. So I think for us, it's been a lot of steep learning curve of which organic systems would work based on which blocks um, and trying to find the balance within those blocks. From a winemaking side, we've definitely seen a increase in the quality of our wines. And I think the ratings over the five years of our internal production has shown that. Um, we still were very focused on selling a lot of our grapes um, to other producers and even there, ratings of their wine that they're buying from us over the last few years have seen drastic improvements. So our current business mindset is to make a lot of more of that wine internally. Our current production has been modest between three and 5,000 bottles per annum. We have been ramping that up over the last two years and look to ramp that up a lot more in the years, two years to come. Um, but we also have other cash flow issues of trying to uh, develop seller space, uh, planting figs, managing labor, bottling costs, etc. as a new developing winemaking uh, enterprise. So yeah, uh, as for us, it is now balancing between managing your labor costs, uh, looking for the right degree of mechanization in a lot of these organic practices that ensure efficiency, but also uh, keep the artisanal way that we're looking to make wine real. Um, our management of our vineyards, we want to keep completely manual. We do not want to bring in machinery, machinery for pruning or for uh, leaf dropping or for topping, etc. We want to keep that as manual as possible, but definitely things like scuffling, reed removal, um, spraying, which has always been mechanized to a certain degree that we are looking and buying in equipment to make that a lot more easy and efficient. And I think this is where the sector, um, sector bodies, people like Vinpro, uh, grouping such as Unpoison, um, the PGS groups that have developed um, both biodynamically and for organic uh, producers, the Sawaso standard, the EU standards, etc where those type of communities need to come together to define easier processes of compost making, uh, local depots where compost manufacturing can be well run, well operated, well checked, uh, ensuring uh, access to organic inputs where required because um, still a lot of the agents are very pro-chemical or their main suppliers are the big monopoly agrochemical guys. So how do we align and bring in the alternatives? How do we market them to the farming collectives? How do we create uh, organic nodes and learning centers and resource hubs that can serve these farmers. So I think, yes, we've had a lot of access to them. We've had access to Biodynamic Association, to Sowaso, to, and because of Sowaso, we've had great uh, access to a lot of 
the resources that we are that we know are available with organic farming. But I think even with all of those resources, the practical uh, alignment within our area is very minimal. Um, compost making and how it is made, even when it is made in our area, it still would fall off ideal organic practice. So it, it almost isolates organic producers in terms of their operation. And this is where for us also the move towards biodynamics makes sense as to try to become as self-sufficient as Rainica put it as possible and not rely on the external inputs. Um, for us, we have been applying the biodynamic preps on the farm for the last few years, um, not as, what can I say, as religious as uh, on 501 as well with 500, but those guys that know, and we've had a lot of disagreements with Helen. Rick, and, I'm going to uh, need to uh, stop you there, just from a time perspective. No. Um, I found it really, really interesting, and I would have loved to have heard you speak a lot more about what you're doing and how you're doing it. So a suggestion or an idea that I have is possibly after this webinar in the next few weeks, we can actually, um, I'd love to engage more with you and Johan and Johan and just get more details, maybe even write them up um, a little bit more about the, the technical process and um, uh, you know what, what you've actually experienced. Um, so our next speaker is Henny Lowe from Control Union who I believe will be explaining um, about some of the standards and uh, his personal experience of what farmers go through. And it's over to you. Yes, uh, sure. Thanks a lot, uh, Regine. Um, I've prepared a small presentation. Uh, Regine, can you just indicate whether you can see my screen? Yes, we can see. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so I think I would just first of all like to introduce control union as a company um, so we are our head office is based in in the netherlands um, so we, uh, we we're a certification company of offering many different types of certifications and amongst other than organic certification um, so we've uh, established in 1920, so last year we've celebrated our 100 years of existence. And then we have um, a footprint uh, uh, in just over 70 countries. Um, so it's a it's a family-owned business. It's owned by the Peterson family. Um, in that's from from the Netherlands, and we're currently just over 4,000 people that that works uh, at at the company. So that's just a little bit about um, control union. So with regards to the different um, standards, organic standards that's available, um, there's many, um, but the most popular ones out there will be the EU um, standard that's for exports, exports to Europe and the NOP standard for exports to the US. And then also the SOSA standard um, that uh, permits uh, uh, or allows companies uh, to certify against our very own private um, South African organic standard that will allow you to sell organically certified products um, locally to local retailers. And then there's also the Chinese organic standard that is increasing in, in popularity. So there's many different um, organic standards or regulations out there and as a producer and or processor the client then will have to make sure that you comply to the you know to the specific regulation that of the company or of the of the country that that you would like to export to um, so I was asked to talk a bit about um, the transitioning, the transitioning phases. So um, I think in summary, there's basically three scenarios. Um, so for a farm to convert from a conventional farm over to um, an, an organic farm, uh, the first scenario will be uh, that you have used uh, a non-allowed or disallowed substance within the past three years. Um, and that will mean that uh, that form will have to go through a conversion period. 
And for grapevines, the conversion period will be three years. And uh, it's important for uh, the producers uh, to realize or for the companies to, to know that the conversion period will start on the day that you sign a contract with the certification body. Um, so I often get the question asked by producers that, um, you know, they've used say 12 months or 24 months ago, they've used the prebooted substance, but if they taste the soil now, or if they taste the leaves of um, the vines or the grapes that they don't detect that substance in it anymore. Um, but for the organic certification part, um, it's a holistic system. So you will have to follow organic principles um, for at least three years before you can then qualify for, um, you know, for, for full on on certification so even though um, it's testing residue free it doesn't mean that it's um, an organic product uh, you need to follow all all organic principles uh, that's that's prescribed by the specific regulation that you would like to comply to um, so the second scenario will then be uh, like you said um, you from Waverly said that Waverly yields um, basically formed organically from the start. So if a client or if a producer um, has followed organic principles for at least three years, and um, as a certification body, we can then see that, uh, you know, through records that you've kept of inputs used, et cetera, that um, only allowed inputs um, was used on the farm. Uh, then that certification body is uh, then allowed to grant uh, a retroactive recognition of the conversion period. So that in essence will allow the farm to skip the three year conversion period. So you'll have to show then through your records that you've kept that you have only used um, substances allowed against, for example, the EU or substances allowed or inputs allowed against the NOP or the SOSO standard. Uh, and then the certification body per regulation is allowed to grant the retroactive recognition. And it's also just um, important to note that um, the, the procedure that the certification body follows in order to grant such a derogation to a client differs between certification bodies. So the regulations prescribe that, you know, the certification bodies must follow uh, then a specific procedure but the, the procedures are not um, uh, uh, exactly stipulated in the regulation. It's up for the certification bodies to decide. So it often happens that different um, procedures are followed, um, but there is uh, then that option if you followed organic principles for at least three years. And then the final option will be uh, if uh, a client has virgin land that they would like to clear and then plant the vines or whatever crop um, they would like to plant, that uh, that virgin land can then also qualify or they can apply for retroactive recognition of the conversion period and that land can then receive or that parcel of land can then receive organic uh, status or its organic status. Um, so in short, that's um, the transition period. Um, the other important part that um, Johan from Reinecke spoke about earlier on, and Brett as well, and Johan from Waverley, is the importance of cover crop. So, you know, the, the regulations actually um, requires uh, for producers producing perennial crops to uh, have some form of crop rotational program in place. Um, you know, and that, that means the cover crop that you uh, grow or that you sow in between your vines. Um, so it is, uh, now a regulatory requirement to have some form of cover crop. Um, so once what often happens is uh, the cover crop has established and it's resowing itself. So that's perfectly fine. But in order for newcomers or new uh, uh, farms to start the process, the basic requirement for the regulation is then to use, um, uh, to use uh, 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 organically certified seeds but uh, 
in practice in South Africa, you know, organically certified seeds are not uh, commercially available. So that's usually not an option. Or if it's available, it's not available in sufficient quantity for our producers. And then once again, um, you can apply with your certification body to use conventional uh, um, conventional seeds for your cover crops. However, conventional seeds might just not be treated and um, it, 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 it shouldn't be uh, from, from any GM origin or the seeds might not be genetically modified. Um, so once again, the different certification bodies follows different procedures um, to give permission to the producers to then make use of the, um, the, the, uh, the, the conventional untreated seed. So it's important then for you to, to, to just cooperate with the certification body or with your certification body in order to get such permission. And uh, in, in my experience, it often happens that farmers use seeds and then when they are audited, then it uh, is communicated to the auditor that they've used uh, the, the untreated seeds, but they've never applied for the derogation. So uh, it's important for the farmers to apply for a derogation prior to the seeds being sown and to obtain the approval from the certification body prior to the seeds being sown. Uh, so that's just important um, to take note of that as well. Then, with the regulations with regards to the wine processing or the actual production of the wine, um, I mean, there's obviously there's different ingredients in the wine. There's the actual, you know, the, the, the grapes that goes in it. There's the different yeasts. There's the tannins, the tartaric acid, um, etc. So it's important to make sure that whatever ingredient that you add to your wine, that it is allowed within the specific regulation that, that you would like to certify to. So we typically, uh, for Sawoso, for example, we will look at uh, Appendix 4 and Appendix 7 to see whether the, the ingredients listed in the is allowed. For NOP, we will look at the 205 regulation as well as the OMRI list. And then for EU at Annex 8 and Annex 8A to see whether the ingredients or um, you know, whether it's processing aids, additives, et cetera, whether it's actually um, allowed to be used within, within the wine. So for the yeast, um, once again, the regulations require clients to use organic yeasts, but often the, the specific uh, yeast strains that the wine clients would like to use is not organically available. Um, and so if you can then show to your certification body that the specific yeast strain that you would like to use is not organically available, your certification body can give you permission then to use the conventional yeast strain. Um, however, if it's organically available, then um, you will be uh, obliged to use the yeast strain that is available in, in, in organic format. And it's also important then to just um, obtain proof from the yeast supply that the yeast is not uh, genetically modified. So what other differences are there between the standards? Um, so what we've come across uh, recently is, uh, especially between the EU and uh, the NOP standard, and then also then between the SOSA and the NOP standard is the use of sulfur dioxide. So sulfur dioxide is allowed within all the standards, um, but for NOP, it will immediately classify your wine as a made with organic grape uh, wine. So it falls in under a different category, but um, so it's not an organic wine. It's not 100% organic wine. It's a made with organic grape wine, um, but then also the use of potassium bisulfate and potassium metabisulfate, um, which is allowed for EU and for so also, but um, We've uh, recently had um, some cases where uh, it was used in knob wines, and we've also started communicating with other, other certification bodies out there. And we've come to the conclusion that you know, it's different substances than sulfur dioxide that is listed in the knob standard. Um, so in essence, it's just important for clients um, or for certification bodies uh, to communicate with clients and for clients then to communicate with certification bodies to make sure that whatever the substances um, they, they add to the wine, the processing aids or additives, that it is then indeed uh, allowed within that specific standard. 
So what other differences are there? Um, so for Sarosu, Sarosu um, has a social part uh, connected to the standards. So that's quite different when compared to the EU and the NOP regulations. Um, so for Sarosu, we will typically look at whether the, the, um, the workers receive minimum wage, what the housing conditions are, if they are receiving, um, if there's housing uh, provided for them on the farms. And then so also also has a biodiversity section. So NOP also has a biodiversity section connected to the standard, but so also has is, is a bit more focused on that. So you need to have a biodiversity plan on how you will maintain and increase uh, biodiversity on your farm. And it's actually quite nice because I think organic farming and uh, and and maintaining and increasing biodiversity is quite an integral part of the entire system. Um, and then also parallel production. So that in essence mean, uh, for example, yeah, I've just put some pictures of pecan nuts, but it's applicable to vine, vines as well, where for EU and, and so also they don't allow parallel production. So on the same production unit, um, for example, you won't be allowed to produce Sauvignon Blanc grapes in organic and conventional quality. Um, you will have to eventually convert all Sauvignon Blanc over to, to organic. Um, however, for NOP, uh, they they will allow such such kind of production, so you, you will be able to produce organic and conventional um, Sauvignon Blanc, as long as you can prove that you um, that the grapes don't commingle, etc., and that there's sufficient barriers um, and so on between the different vines. Um, so also in my experience, what other issues are there? The one is most definitely drift, um, especially uh, with some farms that's um, closely situated to uh, organic farms that's closely situated to conventional farms. So the particles of um, of the crop sprayers that they're spraying drifts quite far. It doesn't only drift 20 or 50 meters. So it's important for the clients to just closely work with the certification bodies to obtain you know, solutions to whatever the issues are that they are experiencing in this regard. And then documentation. Um, a, a large part of organic farming, whether it's farming or processing, is uh, to keep and to maintain records. Uh, so you need to, to basically record and write down everything that you do. And then communication with certification bodies. Um, I've experienced that there's uh, often a lack of communication between, you know, from certification bodies to clients and then also from clients to certification bodies. So, um, you know, there needs to be open and constant communication and, and uh, uh, cooperation between the, the, the two entities, the client and the certification body. And then also um, one of the, the legs of, of Johan's uh, three-legged chair that he spoke about is cost, um, so money with the cost of certification is often something that uh, prevents clients from, from certifying or from obtaining uh, organic certification. So that's something that, that uh, is definitely um, being looked at and there are now uh, more cost-effective options uh, out there. So yes, in short, that's, that's me and uh, what uh, I hope that that uh, some of the information was cleared or that my presentation at least helped some of some of you out there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henny. That was very, very informative. Much appreciated. Um, I'll ask for questions to go into the chat. Um, there is a question for later in the Prezo, just on whether banks are, um, are still a deterrent from doing anything organically. So we can come to that at the end. Um, but now let's move on to Shelley from WWF. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for staying on. And thank you for the opportunity um, to be able to be part of this conversation. I think it's a really important conversation. Um, and I've also prepared a few slides. So just let me know once you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, great. I'm gonna um, stop my video for now and then just find the presentation mode because it's blocked by my, there we go. So good morning, everyone. Again, thank you. Um, we've heard, 
wow, a lot of informative um, presentations already and discussions. And um, I'm just going to shift focus a little bit. Um, I, I work at uh, WWF South Africa, so the Worldwide Fund for Nature. And um, we have, an, have a number of different programs. And for this audience and for this topic, I just wanted to, to hopefully inspire and, and get us working together to be able to enhance what's already um, incredible action on the ground um, in the South African wine industry and to gain recognition. So um, within South Africa, we've got quite a unique um, um, circumstance in that um, although globally, this is actually the reality. Um, if we hone in in South Africa, um, a, lot, a lot of the, the natural area is already um, highly degraded. Obviously, we, this has uh, come to the fore now through the pandemic and through the, the state of the, of the planet that we're in. Um, but within South Africa, exceptionally, um, we live in a biodiverse um, part of the world. Uh, Regina, you uh, mentioned in the beginning that, you know, within just the Cape Floral Kingdom, which is, which is a biodiversity hotspot, um, that over 9,000 plant species um, survive here and, and it competes with the agricultural landscape. So already we have 80% um, of South Africa's land is, is farmland um, and yet not much of that is, um, is, is necessarily um, done in a commercial way. So of that 80%, there's a lot of small scale growers, there's a lot of communal and subsistence farming. So if we're honing in on, on kind of the um, high impact commodities, uh, we certainly need um, to shift the way things are, are moving. Um, so in South Africa, 62% uh, of, of the water that we use is used for irrigation, obviously agricultural irrigation, um, and 10% of South African land is all we have, um, and it, yet it provides 50% of our surface water. So that is the strategic water source areas that we, um, we call the water factories of South Africa. And so we work with producers that are um, within those landscapes and we call them the stewards of the land. Um, and within the Western Cape, as mentioned, the Cape Floral Kingdom is a biodiversity hotspot. So it's the smallest but most diverse plant kingdom of the, of the world. Um, and just to give you a bit of context, just on Table Mountain alone, um, the tourist hotspot, uh, there's over 2000 plant species, which is more than the entire United Kingdom. So we really do have a, a unique um, environment in which to grow food and to produce wine. And if you overlay that map of the Cape Floral Kingdom with the wine growing regions, you can see why it's so critical um, to be able to produce wine in a way that's not harming um, this biodiversity um, because no other industry is as dependent on nature as agriculture, of course. We've heard already from the previous speakers um, how important it is to be able to have a living soil and to be able to have um, the biodiversity functioning um, in order to be able to, to farm. And so within the wine industry, we have a lot to, to celebrate. And, and one of the, the aspects is um, the fact that because the wine industry in South Africa is, is within this biodiversity hotspot of the Cape Floral Kingdom, um, the wine industry and, and the conservation sector ourselves and at the time the Botanical Society came together and realized we're competing, that nature and agriculture are competing for the same resources and the same footprint. So if the industry is going to be continuing into the future, we need to, to set up a partnership and make sure that the way we're farming is not having a huge impact um, on the natural environment. And so in the early 2000s, um, the integrated production of wine uh, was established and you can recognize that integrity and, and sustainability seal that is now on the neck of over 90% of the South African wine industry that's exported um, of, on the South African wine. And that's quite an achievement um, and something that we really should, should enhance in terms of celebrating it. And so now I just also wanted to touch on the fact that, you know, there's a lot, a lot of different systems in place and a lot 
um, of good intentions and and yet uh, still a lot of, of confusion out there in terms of what are the different systems and schemes and I think essentially we we're all trying to reward the commitments and the levels of different types of, of environmentally friendly farming um, and so we established um, the biodiversity and wine initiative um, in partnership with the wine industry and building on the, the IPW seal. Um, we started in 2004 as well. And uh, it was originally called the Biodiversity in Wine Initiative. And um, it then evolved over the next 10 years, uh, working with over 200 farms at one stage, um, providing free advice and technical assistance to be able to understand what the environmental risks are and really to, to develop plans that make it uh, tangible and uh, not just a, a tick box uh, exercise, but really providing the biodiversity um, criteria as well as, as well as the technical support to implement those changes. And so I think that's a critical aspect that I did want to highlight is that as much as all of these standards and certifications are out there uh, and, and um, a critical element is really being able to provide the support and to be able to implement those changes. Um, but um, so since, since uh, its establishment, um, the Biodiversity and Wine Initiative, then we rebranded and restructured in 2016, um, now called the Conservation Champions Program under WWF. And if we're not um, exclusively promoting organic or biodynamic. You've heard about the differences, but really what we're trying to promote is a shift to more restorative, regenerative practices. Um, we're not a certification scheme by any means. We are building on the, the integrity and sustainability certification scheme and really trying to recognize and reward those commitments um, that many of the farms have um, in the wine industry. And I think it's critical, many of the previous speakers also said, to recognize that it is a journey. There's a lot that it takes to be organic and to shift from conventional farming to biodynamic and regenerative farming. And, I, and too often, I think there's a, there's a fine line that you, it's either in or out or pass or fail. And so we really are trying to, to push the fact that, that there's recognition of the journey. And our logo represents um, also the, the partnerships and the symbiosis in that. So the Cape Sugarbird and the Protea only exist here in the Cape Floral Kingdom. And the two rely on each other. So the Sugarbird uh, pollinates the Protea and, and also um, feeds off of the, the nectar and the insects that live in the Protea. And so we couldn't do what we do. We couldn't conserve um, all, over 20,000 hectares of critical feinbos and succulent habitats if it wasn't for the wine farms that we work with. And likewise, um, the fruit and, and vegetable and other farms we work with. But in this program, I just wanted to highlight that it, it really is about partnership. And I think that's clear out there as well, that no, no farm can do this on their own. And that collaboration really is, is critical. And so now to shift to, to the space we've been um, discussing in terms of that purchase power in the in the in the midst in the in the fog really of consumer confusion there are many labels out there and so how do we help the consumer understand um, the biodiversity elements the healthy soils how we do rely on nature and how their purchase is supporting um, that harmony um, I know we're running short of time, so I'm going to try and um, speed up a little bit, but I, I think some of the previous speakers have already uh, alluded to this, but it is important to support credible systems, but understanding that not all, not, it's not a one size fits all, um, you know, there are different approaches taken, um, and the, the local context is really critical. Quite often these international standards are not taking into account what is happening on the ground and, and recognizing the local contexts. And so I think it's important to be able to support South African developed um, uh, systems. 
and tell your story. Tell your story about where you are. It doesn't only have to be about a label or um, uh, a certain product, but tell your story as we've heard this morning. It's inspirational. If, if as a consumer, that's what, that's what people are wanting to hear, but making it tangible, you know, making it understandable, making them see the pictures. We have such beautiful imagery that we can use. Um, and we've seen now in, in lockdown when, when we weren't able to connect with our consumers face to face. Um, it's been wonderful to see how virtual tastings are taking off, um, how the videos of harvest or of nature in the vineyards is really helping to share the stories and connecting um, to the consumer. And there are a lot of resources out there. Recently, we've published a, a, a report showcasing that it is possible uh, to produce what we need to produce on the planet um, together with, uh, with biodiversity. And, and of course, so there's resources out there, but as I said, it's about making it tangible and about producing while restoring nature. So we have to take that shift um, and make sure that, that businesses, that government, that markets understand that nature is the foundation of our society and of our economy. It's, it has to shift the way, the way we are valuing the system. And that's one of the critical elements in, in what we're trying to do specifically in our South African office is to connect people with nature. And we've got a, wonderful examples, um, just a few uh, illustrated here, but really trying to um, bring that message through in terms of when you make those shifts that nature returns um, and then pulling that into your logo, pulling it into the label like Waverly Hills has done so beautifully, bringing, bringing your wine taste to, tasting um, visitors into the Feinbos and teaching them about what, what happens on the farm. Um, this other image at Bartony where they, they have replanted Feinbos in between the vineyards, um, but it's also their emblem, their logo. So again, using nature as part of your marketing is 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 a wonderful opportunity um, and a way of returning that investment that you've put in to shifting that behavior. It is expensive, but it also can bring alternative incomes in terms of tourism and, and uh, a marketing advantage. So just uh, a, a few more um, points to close off. Um, I think there's a lot we can still do in terms of getting our message out there. Um, we've heard that we, it is always about uh, the difference in understanding what is behind the, the label um, and, and connecting um, the consumer with what, what is being done at the farm. Um, I've done a COVID period around more online presence, virtual tastings, but equally um, connecting at a farm level. So bringing people, bringing the visitors to the farm, taking them through the vineyards, feeling the soil, um, there's plenty of, of market research that shows that people really do want to connect with where their food comes from. And then, of course, working together. Um, there's, there is this movement that needs to happen, but, but the scale at which it needs to shift within, within agriculture, both locally and globally, can only be done together. Um, and if we share our innovations and if we share our partnerships and our connections, then I do think we have a long way to go and we, we will get there. And so just one other image in terms of, of, of enhancing the consumer engagement. Um, as a conservation organization, we never really um, knew the power of social media in terms of trying to promote the awareness of, of our conservation champion program. And so we've been testing the waters with different aspects of, of uh, influencer drops, and of showcasing what it means behind the logo. And I really do think that that, that is something that we could do um, at scale and with, um, with a number of different uh, farms and, and institutions. Pairing wine and food, of course, pairing Feinbos with wine, it really is all about telling the story behind, um, behind the journey. So in closing, I think there's a lot to be celebrated in the South African wine industry. We've come a long way and there's a lot of innovations and progressions that we're doing. Um, it shouldn't only be seen as just organic or biodynamic or all of these technical terms. It should be about sharing um, the personal stories and, and the journey that, that is 
that is evident and really taking the illustrations of, of nature out. Um, the research and innovation is there. There's still some work that needs to be done, but I think there is a lot that needs to be done in terms of making it accessible and practical. Um, and, and then also, yeah, there was a question around market incentives and whether financial institutions can also be drawn into this narrative. And I really think that that is critical. Um, we need to be able to make the financial institutions be part of this in order to incentivize the shift uh, to provide um, uh, better loans, lower interest rates and things like that for farms that are um, doing the right thing. And so I think that's the end of my discussion. I welcome feedback. It was quite a lot to get through in such a short time. But um, yeah, I thank you again for the opportunity and I welcome any further contact points and uh, questions. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, really great presentation. I think just a question um, that I would love to ask is how, what is the bar? Where is the bar set for being a conservation, for being part of the program? Um, and how do you measure um, the progress of the farms? Do you look at soil health? Do you look at biodiversity? Do, um, if, if you're not a standard, um, how, how, how do you quantify that almost? Mm, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so we visit the farms every year. Uh, there are strict criteria in terms of joining as a conservation champion. Um, so they need a, a certain 70% um, IPW score. Um, and then they need to show their commitment in terms of being a water conservation champion a nature conservation champion or an energy conservation champion. So essentially three, three categories, because we also recognize quite often um, farms might not have natural area that they can set aside and conserve, but their farming, like Johan Renneke and like Johan, well, Waverly Hills has beautiful natural area, but some of the farms, it's about how they're farming that we wanted to, to recognize and showcase. So. There are strict criteria, as I mentioned. They also sign um, an agreement with us as WWF to say that they're committing to farming um, uh, against these criteria. Uh, and every year we check up on that. We visit them at least once a year. We have a detailed environmental management plan that we develop with them. And then we, uh, we make sure that, that they're achieving what they want to achieve. But it's important for us that it's not necessarily a pass or fail. Obviously, if they're not meeting those criteria, we need to work with them and say, what happened? Um, but we piggyback on, the, on our certification scheme of IPW. That is where the independent audit happens. And we ask that they do get, the, the, that the conservation champion farms um, are environmental leaders. So they're getting that 70% score. But, but we're trying to, promote the, their commitment in other aspects as well. Does that answer your question? Um, I think so. I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the IPW standards, um, so I'll have okay. to read up more, more about it. And just one last question. With regards to the kinds of inputs um, that are permitted on the farms, um, just, yeah, it would be good to understand where those sit in the um, in the list of highly hazardous pesticides um, and the kind, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just being mm. the unpoisoned, the unpoisoned group, uh, highly hazardous absolutely. pesticides are obviously top of mind. Mm. No, absolutely. So um, the, the industry standard, um, the IPW standard does get reviewed um, every few years. And I do believe there is a lot that can be pushed in terms of, um, but in, in essence, um, unless we inform and, and offer alternatives, uh, I think the industry tends to fall back on the fact that um, certain hazardous substances are still allowed within the South African laws. And it's actually international market that then pushes and says, well, actually, if you want to import your product, you're not allowed to be um, using these pro chemical products. And so, although there's, there's a lot of progression in, in the South African farming instances, there is still a lot that can be done. And again, I, I reiterate, I think that we need to 
communicate, we need to make the science more practical, and we need to offer alternatives and communicate that message out there. As WWF, we're obviously trying to promote as much of a shift towards restoring um, the soil and bringing back healthy soils, and hazardous chemicals are not part of that equation. Um, but again, it's, it's a journey. So we recognize that there's a, there's a certain way of farming that we have to, we have to break that um, over time. And so, yeah, there's no short answer for me to give you except to say that uh, the default is to go against, uh, go with what uh, South African law uh, uh, regulates and, uh, and until there's alternatives against the glyphosates and the poison hazardous substances, um, there will always be that pullback. Okay, thank you. I think that just really highlights um, the, the work that Unpoison is called to do all the different organizations, which is um, having, is affecting change to policy. And I think once we, once we can, once we can get uh, a policy reform um, through consumer awareness, uh, that great report but with Rosa Luxemburg on the double standards for import and export, if we can get our imports, uh, our local standards um, up to the same as export and, and better, then we can rely on all of these mechanisms. So thank you so much, Shelley. We're on the journey with you. Um, and it was, it was great. Thank you for your excellent presentation. There's a quick, I see a quick hand up from Sharon. A very, very quick question, and then we're going to move on to Daniel Kotzer from EcoCert. Okay, I see Sharon's question there. Of course, <laughs> uh, yeah, restorative is restoring um, the natural functions. Um, and so you're saying, uh, how can I explain, how can I explain that term if it doesn't mean non-chemical? Um, so all I'm all all that I meant there is that, um, as as the previous speakers mentioned, it's not always possible to go from one way of farming to another because you do have to be economically viable. So what we are promoting and and clearly what this audience is also interested in is shifting away from the chemicals towards a healthy system that is is uh, restored, and so healthy soil requires far less inputs and and by removing those chemicals it's the first step in that process but i'm just uh i was just reiterating the fact that it can't it it's not always easy or possible to go from a conventional farming practices to using no chemicals thank you i just also want to remind all of the listeners about how johan said that he took only about a quarter of a hectare to start converting first um, I think, and then did it incrementally while he was finding that balance. Thank you so much, Shelley. Uh, Daniel Kotzer, uh, great. Thanks. Thanks, Regine. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to talk as well. Uh, it almost feels like a small reunion of uh, our 2018 Organic Wine Symposium uh, with many of the same speakers. And it's really, it's, it's exciting to see um, platforms like these and, you know, small study groups um, with the same topic is becoming uh, becoming uh, more regular and more popular. Um, yeah, for instance, in two weeks' time, I'm also I'm joining another study group of about uh, 20 farmers, wine farmers in the Stellenbosch region, for um, specifically on the topic of, of organic farming and certification. So the organic industry is really it's a it's an exciting place to be. Uh, just looking at at some of the stats uh, in terms of uh, global figures the the value of the organic industry uh, is about 106 billion euros um, of which uh, around about uh, 45 billion euros is um, is generated within uh, the european union so that gives you an idea of of uh, how massive the industry is in terms of hectares we're looking at 70 about 73 million hectares uh, worldwide and uh, in terms of in terms of growth, uh, just taking one country like France, for example, we have uh, we've seen, and this is 2019 stats. Uh, this is the, the the most recent stats we have from Fibble. So there's been a 13 percent um, year-on-year growth, uh, and we also expect this growth to increase um, during and after the pandemic, uh, the, the the coronavirus pandemic. So it's really it's an exciting space to be in. 
Um, just before I start, also just a quick introduction on, on ECOSID. We are, uh, we are uh, an international company, but our head office is based in France. Um, we've got 26 offices around the world from which we service about 130 different countries. Um, and in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the services that we offer, we, we not only do organic farming, we also uh, attest uh, fertilizers and, and pest control products for use in organic agriculture. Uh, we've got, uh, we offer sustainable agriculture uh, standards like Rainforest Alliance and then also social standards uh, that includes uh, Fair for Life, which is a fair trade standard. We've been operating for, for 30 years now um, and we're the leading organic certification body globally uh, and also uh, locally in South Africa. And this is just a... a um, a list moving on to the wine industry specifically a list of, of our clients that we have um, that certified for for organic wine um, it doesn't mean that all of the wines are <laughs> organic um, but this gives you a, a good idea i think that um, you're not alone in if you if you think of making the transition of, of moving over to organic uh, there's a lot of uh, role players in the industry um, people to um, like <laughs> Johan Reinig uh, early on um, is always a very friendly guy and, and, and you know there's thousands of people knocking at his door and he's always willing to help so there's lots of people in the industry to talk with um, to, uh, to get some help specific to South Africa if, if we look at our organic industry it's still very small uh, in terms of wine farms we are uh, um, We've got about, at, at Ecoset, we've got about uh, 21 certified clients in total, I think, with other certification bodies looking at, at around 40 clients. But it's still, in, in total, in terms of hectares, it's about 40, uh, sorry, about 1,000 hectares, just over 1,000 hectares in total for South Africa, making it uh, around 1% of the total uh, vineyard production area in the country. So it's still very small, and I think a lot of room for growth. And then uh, I don't want to, to uh, repeat uh, necessarily in terms of the standards what Danny said. I'm just going to give you the, the two main standards, um, which is the EU organic standard and the American organic, uh, organic standard called the National Organic Program. What's the main difference in terms of wine uh, comparing these two? Because these are the two most popular standards to go for since most of our wine uh, are exported to either Europe uh, or, or the States. So the, the main difference is actually that for, for the EU, they've got a dedicated standard, uh, which was written in 2012 for wine specifically. Um, so it's, it's easier to make organic wine in terms of the, the allowed inputs, uh, specifically in the wine. So you may add sulfur to your wine and call it organic wine, like any mentioned. Um, and you can use sulfur dioxide, potassium meta or uh, potassium bisulfite. And you can label it as organic wine. Uh, on the NOP side, they don't have a specific standard, so it's, they've got a general food standard, which makes it slightly more difficult. Um, sulfur is not allowed. If you do use sulfur, and you can only use it in the sulfur dioxide um, uh, composition, if you do use it, then you have to label your wine as uh, wine made with, with organic grapes. And then shortly, I'm going to look at... Um, not specifically in terms of you know the different standards, but generally, what do guys use on organic farms? Um, just from my experience visiting some of these farms, what would be um, the go-to for most guys? Because uh, there is also a perception in organic that there's very little things that you're allowed to use. So in terms of pest control, uh, you are allowed to use sulfur and copper. These are um, probably the two most prominent fungicides um, that people use. Still, a lot, of, uh, a lot of guys try to move away from copper uh, because uh, copper buildup in your soils is also uh, quite a dangerous thing. So when they use copper, they try to limit it. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, actually can replace copper uh, is if you do get some natural trichoderma products. There's wetting agents that you can use. A, a popular one is new film P because this one is both allowed for the EU and for the American standard. Uh, the use of natural predators and then just to note that uh, there's no herbicides uh, allowed in organic agriculture so this makes it quite um, intensive in terms of your labor um, a lot of people use uh, they generally use mulches uh, or cover crops 
some people use mechanical clearing. There's some farms that's been looking into things like uh, machines to use steam for, for killing off the herbs. Uh, and then more holistic farms that also use animals to come in for, uh, for grazing. On the fertilization side, uh, compost. Uh, and obviously, if you can use on-farm uh, compost, it's, it's your first prize. Chicken manure pellets, uh, which is uh, generally um, available uh, all over the country. Uh, there's some people using guano, um, mostly in, in, you get the guano in both the, the, the slow release pellet form and the liquid form. Uh, most prefer the liquid form to, to put through the irrigation pipes, uh, fish emulsion, kelp extract. And then interesting enough, the, uh, the, the product allowed in organic agriculture with the highest nitrogen content is actually feather meal. So this is also something that organic farmers tend to either mix into uh, the substance that they use or um, use it in, in purely in, in small amounts. If you can prove that uh, there's some uh, deficiencies in your plants, you're allowed to use certain trace elements. And then, you know, to prepare your soil, uh, these soil conditioners uh, like natural gypsum, uh, ground limestone that you can use. And then in terms of nitrogen content, like Johan also mentioned, um, you know, getting plants, uh, nitrogen fixing plants in um, like your, uh, your lupins uh, is, a, is a really good idea. And, uh, but I mean, not only for fertilization, for a lot of, you know, different purposes, the cover crops are really, um, are really essential to, to organic farming. And then just finally, quickly, I want to show you, um, this is one of our clients on the left-hand side, uh, one of our certified organic clients. And this picture was taken last year in the winter. Um, and it's, <laughs> so obviously the vineyards on the right-hand side of the picture um, is not carrying leaves on the left-hand side, also not carrying leaves. But the difference you'll see in terms of the green specifically is the cover crops, uh, which is a really nice image um, to compare the two and the difference that it makes in terms of, you know, cover of your soil. But something else that's interesting uh, to me is also if, if you look uh, closely to the color of the soil as well, where you'll find on the right hand side, there's a much closer resemblance to the same color as the road, uh, the very sandy um, and eroded uh, soil on that side. And you'll find a much uh, a darker and a deeper brown in between the green uh, on the organic side. So this is a really uh, a nice comparison of, uh, you know, in terms of long term, um, the, the benefits to your soil of, of organic agriculture. Um, and then just quickly, quickly I think the, 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 the things that's been most uh, prominent in terms of when speaking to people, you know, they want to switch to organic, they worried about a lot of things. Um, they're worried about the yield, um, which Jan also spoke about. Yes, you, you'll probably have a, a, a reduced yield, but remember, it's not organic. It's not a quick fix, um, so it's a long-term commitment, uh, you know, to healthier soils and and better quality grapes. So this is important to remember. Um, People are scared of, of a lot of diseases. The, the, the positive news is that there's a lot, a lot of really good options um, and new softer products that's being developed, um, microbial products, um, and a lot of uh, research being done on that. Um, and then also they're worried about, uh, you know, selling their products and, and getting access to the market. Um, and in terms of this, uh, I really have to say there's, there's a, big growth, as I mentioned, big growth in the organic market. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of options to, you know, to access markets directly. And interestingly as well, there hasn't been, we haven't had wine clients um, certified organic that actually stopped certification um, at EcoCert, the, um, stopped certification saying that uh, it's not worthwhile um, or they're not gaining market access. So all of the clients that's, uh, that's been with Ecosu, they've continued to do this. So this also shows you that, uh, gives you an indication that there's definitely uh, an, a benefit um, and there's definitely, a, uh, you know, um, some uh, benefits towards access to the market. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to end off by showing you, uh, since <laughs> Johan Reineke didn't show his pictures, he's got really nice pictures, so he gave me permission to show some of his pictures from his farm, uh, which I really like. Um, once you get into organic agriculture, um, 
uh, I remember initially uh, not knowing a lot about uh, this the sector. Uh, you would really enjoy seeing, you know, very neat and clean and um, plantless vineyards. Um, but nowadays, seeing things like this really excites me. Um, and it's something that grows on you. Uh, you can't, once you've started in organic agriculture, it's really difficult, you know, to turn around and see any other way of, of doing things. So in, in summary, I think agriculture, um, not only in South Africa globally, I think agriculture is making a, a, a U-turn. Uh, people are moving towards, you know, not necessarily organic and certified organic agriculture, but moving towards a, a um, a softer approach towards agrochemicals um, and also looking at more natural alternatives, definitely a lot more focus on, on cover crops. Uh, what I found is that um, it isn't organic, isn't a trend. Uh, organic is really, it, it's, it's turning into a major market. And for me personally, the most important um, is that in South Africa that we, uh, that we um, become more sustainable in, in our practices, in our farming practices. Um, obviously, becoming certified organic is nice, but that's not the, the, the primary uh, importance. I think it's really important for us to look after our soils. Um, but in doing that and in maintaining good sustainable standards, uh, you can always look into uh, certification as, as being a major uh, benefit to dis distinguishing your product from our other products um, and also getting access to markets. Thank you very much. Um, you'll also see my details on the final screen, so you're welcome to contact me uh, afterwards as well if you have questions. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, there, there's a question um, I think all of us uh, had when you showed your slide um, of all of your different wine farms and partners, I think, um, when you said not all of them are organic. Would you mind just explaining what you meant by that? So not, um, not all of them produce necessarily, they, they um, have their own organic vineyards. So some of them would buy in organic grapes or organic wines from, from other farms. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of guys actually tend to do this to start off in the organic market. So they build a brand around a, a certain organic wine. Um, and when they see this is something that works, uh, they also start shifting their own to get also to get volumes of grapes. They also start uh, converting their own farm to organic agriculture. So it's, it's uh, one of those risks that, uh, you know, uh, people try to do to, to see how the market is performing um, and then committing their own farm. But in other cases, also people are allowed to, um, to, to do both organic and conventional, to sell both organic and conventional wines. Um, the, the, let's say the most popular model that we have is, is someone would have their own organic farm um, but in the cellar, what they would do um, to diversify is they, you know, they produce a, a prestigious organic um, estate wine, but they would also buy in grapes, conventional grapes uh, from other producers and, and produce another conventional range as well. Um, so that's, that's what I meant with that. Okay, thank you. That's interesting. Um, a question that I have also just on the financial uh, viability. Do you do any kind of baseline um, with your farmers as to costs and um, revenue and profit and kind of measure how they fare as they go along the journey with you in transitioning? Do you have any kind of compelling uh, financial data um, or is that not, not really the, the line of vision? Um, no, it's, it's, that's not, unfortunately, it's not within in the scope. So, um, what we do is, is, you know, we go in and we see whether, whether this company complies to the specific regulations. Um, and even though this is our scope, we try to, you know, we try to also, besides that, we try to support uh, the person in terms of, uh, you know, technical um, assistance with understanding the, the different standards. Um, we have access to, to the company's you know, uh, financial data, should we wish to have that, um, but we don't track that. It's not something that we track and so, you know, to see whether a company is, is, you know, is making it financially or not. The only indication I have is that, as I mentioned, uh, we don't have anyone that's, you know, that's surrendered their certification uh, in terms of wine farms uh, that started certification and dropped out of the process uh, you know, somewhere along the line. Thank you. Um, I think one of the important um, important messages it would be good to understand and research possibly is as we've got this big push towards smart agriculture 
um, drones and smart agriculture, jobs and livelihoods are obviously threatened. And with the, the mulching and the cover crops and the weeding, um, that's a great source of employment, um, but possibly ones that farmers see as an expense that they could get rid of with smart agri. And uh, I think just a really critical part of our building our case um, would be to show the cost, and I'm, I'm talking in general now, uh, also based on Johan Reinecke's presentation, just to show the cost savings uh, when you transition um, that could uh, make continued employment still viable, uh, withstanding all of the pressures that are, that are on the wine industry in South Africa. I think employment and, and livelihoods is a very critical part of the whole discussion. Um, there's one, so we, we've just hit 12 o'clock. I'll understand if everybody needs to go, but it would be great. Those that can, can stay on for a few more questions and discussion. Um, DW has a question just asking on the link to carbon credits um, with, within this model, carbon credits and carbon tax. Can anybody talk to that? Is that your topic, Daniel? Uh, unfortunately, no, not uh, carbon credits are not, not my topic. Okie dokie. Um, I've also, if Johan Dalport is still with us, Johan, do you have any comments on the financial viability and just how Waverly wines might be faring um, per hectare uh, to conventional wine farms? If, they, if, we, if, if we're trying to build that, that uh, research, to incentivize farmers? Yeah, for, from our experience, I think again, it, it, it differs from, from farm to farm or, or institution or company, or the owner of the, the farm. From our experience, the model that, that we use is that it's actually not um, more expensive to farm organically. Um, your, your, your input costs are about the same as conventional farms. If, if you look at um, figures from from um, institutions like One Pro in South Africa, or other um, institutions that, that, that bring that, where you can get agricultural financial figures. So um, from our from our model, it, it's not really more expensive. Uh, the input costs on farming side and wine making side, or even on say on a, on a marketing side. Um, what is what? What actually is more expensive or is an extra cost is the certification cost itself to be certified organic so to to um, to to pay your your membership fees and your um, auditing fees to to your auditing bodies so that that is where the, the extra cost come in um, regards to to the Waverly Hills model at least. Um. Okay, uh, I see we've got two hands up. Um, it, I'll go first if, um, if I may, just trying to tap in to your, the question around carbon credits. Certainly not my area of expertise, but we have been engaging with uh, a company called um, Climate Neutral, the Climate Neutral Group. And uh, they seem to be looking and discussing with various institutions uh, the option of of, of a standard that's on the voluntary carbon market that will be able to pay farmers that are not only organic, but are able to measure the carbon uh, in the soil that has increased over time. So there is, it's finally coming that uh, the, the costs will be offset in some way. Um, so if people are interested, I can connect them with this, with this individual and they can find out more from, from the experts. But from what I know, the costs are, are usually quite expensive to do it on a farm by farm level to enter the carbon market with uh, your, your amount of carbon sequestered. But uh, that's why this method is, is feasible. It seems like they're doing a, a group um, approach. Thank you. Um, let's just see. So Chris has shared a link inclusive carbon. Oh, uh, the bank question um, around financial institutions. I think Shirley did speak to that, saying that they are working with NetBank um, to possibly look at this. And uh, I think, Shirley, do you have any more to say around um, the financial mm -hmm. No, just, just that we have been, 
we've been working on this for a while. Uh, there's a lot of uh, yeah, different regulations in the way the financing institutions uh, uh, stipulate their loan agreements, but we really have been trying hard to showcase. Um, but they always come back to kind of that business model. So if we have examples, we can showcase it to them uh, and then try and shift that, that financial machine. Um, but certainly that's why I say working together is better. Um, I think we are at a time now where we've got the critical mass and we've got the case studies and the, the business case essentially for this. Um, and I think a platform like this would also expand that, not only with Nedbank that we're talking to, but other institutions as well. One of our um, one of our desired topics uh, in future will be unpoison our funding, and uh, I think funding um, shapes the the sector. You know, it, it plays a major role in shaping the sector. I see Busi has a hand up. Busi, yes, hello everyone. Uh, my question is, uh, in fact, it's a it's a it's a request uh, from the sector that. Uh, could there be a readily available schedules, schedules or programs that farmers could use that want to convert from conventional farming to, agri to, to organic farming? Because what usually happens is whilst they are trying to enrich their soil to, to, to make it healthy and uh, follow the organic route, then the problems of, of pests, like Johan was saying at the beginning, when before he could uh, meet with that biodynamic guy, he was uh, troubled with pests and, 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 and all those and diseases. So if then, because farmers would say they would like to convert to organic, but they don't find help easily available for them to, to do, because then if waiting for three years, they, they need to be, financially a, a, a viable, they need to be having their cash flow. And uh, whilst doing that, then there is no help that is coming easily to say, if I've got my vines, if I've got my citrus, this is what I should do starting from planting to harvest the, the organic way. Uh, maybe Busi, I could just quickly say from, from our side, I, um, I definitely agree with your point in terms of not, you know, there not being enough support. Uh, we, from from a certification body side of uh, uh, perspective, we, we try to, you know, give support uh, to people that want to to certify, but unfortunately, um, we we can't cross the line in terms of consultation with with the clients. Uh, you know, all we can do is 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 really look at the implementation of of the standard and the compliance of that. There are uh, a few um, consultants in the industry, uh, but there's definitely a, a, a big lack um, because certification is one side and then agriculture is another side. So having, uh, you know, people that understand both sides of the business um, and how that works is there's definitely a, a big gap in the market and a big uh, lack. Um, but what we would normally do is if, if you, someone would like support, we would advise the consultants. But for me, in this in this case, uh, you know, everyone can't always afford the consultants as well. Um, so, which then it becomes really important uh, to form smaller study groups, uh, to form uh, PGSs, like Brett uh, uh, was also mentioning, um, where farmers can learn from each other and go, you know, maybe speak to farmers and have a mentor farmer that's gone through that uh, whole exercise uh, to to get some hands-on uh, experience and advice from them. Thanks, Daniel. I think just, um, I know that there's a big push to have the organic policy passed. Um, and with the organic policy should come government funding. Um, but having a fund that is connected to the standards to help farmers get on their feet for, for the period that it takes um, to start being certified, I think is definitely a strategy that the um, the agroecological and organic sector needs to push for um, uh, finding finding ways uh, to assist farmers with the you know and compete with the extension services and subsidies of conventional farming is very difficult and we need to build um, we need to build I think institutional and funding support to support uh, the, the growth of the sector 
Um, thank you very much to all of our speakers and to everybody that has attended. So thank you everybody. Uh, without much further ado, just if in parting, I can all ask you to feel and see and envision in within the next 10 years, the South African ecolo um, the South African wine sector becoming the most ecological and fair sector in the world. And let's have that as a goal for our region um, and a way to really build the market share and a way to incentivize farmers towards working towards that goal. So thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Virginia. Bye-bye.